we have Rebecca Khan here today, who's one of the offices of the Pelagios Network, which is a network which connects researchers, scientists and curators to link and explore the history of places. Uh, she's also an associate researcher at the Humboldt Institute for Internet and Society in Berlin. Her research focuses on digitization in museums and archives, and that's a big part of what she'll be talking about today with her presentation, uh, From Strings to Things, Linked Data in Cultural Heritage Collections. So I guess that's me. Go ahead. Oh, thanks. Um, yeah, thank you to Daniel and to Catherine for setting this up and for the invitation and to uh, Patsy and Sally who couldn't be here. Um, it's, yeah, it's really nice to be here and to be talking about some of the stuff that I've been working on um, for the last couple of years. Um, so if we could go to the first slide. Yeah. What I'm going to talk about today, and there's a fair amount in here, so uh, we might have to gallop through some of it. Um, I'm going to briefly talk about creating semantic annotations um, and how that works within the Pelagius Network, how we've built tools to create semantic annotations and to include cultural heritage data into these semantic networks that we've created, uh, why linked data is important in cultural heritage, but also why it's extremely difficult, um, but also why it's very valuable. And then at the end, I would like to run some ideas past you all, and I would really value your feedback, in fact, on some questions I've been thinking about over the last few weeks when it comes to the ethics of museum data, and then particularly how the ethics of museum data translate into questions around the ethics around the use of linked data for cultural heritage collections. Um, so if we jump to the next one, we can start by having a look at what I think is a great example of two forms of scholarly primitives in action. So in the image on the left, what you see, or on my left, I think it's your left as well, um, you see a copy of a manuscript page from a version of the Iliad um, from, um, and what you see is in the middle, the text that's in the middle of that page um, was the original text. Everything that is around that text and that's um, annotated within the text and also along the sides are annotations made by various scholars over the years who have commented on the text, referred to other work. The annotations have been made in various languages um, and by various hands over the years. And in the image on the right, what you'll see is um, a copy of a page from my colleague Elton Barker's book on Homer, so the same topic. Um, and what you see there is I what I consider to be a sort of evolution of the annotations on the manuscript text into what is essentially four pages, um, four lines of text on the page, and then three quarters of a page of footnote. Um, and essentially what you're seeing here is the same scholarly principle playing out, uh, where there is a text that has to be commented on, the work of other people is brought in, opinions are shared, um, there's a process of annotation and collaboration and linking. So what we see here are two examples of those scholarly processes of annotation, collaboration and linking, both referencing the work of others, both drawing on other people's scholarship. The problem here is that both of these sets of annotations are kind of trapped within the page. It's their analog nature that makes it difficult um, to, to expand them beyond the confines of, of the page. If we have a look at the next slide, um, I can speak a little bit about a tool that within the Pelagios network we developed to combat exactly this difficulty. So um, these limitations of how to think about representing annotations and footnotes um, in a digital form is what led to the development of Recogito. Um, and particularly what we were thinking about was how the web and linked data and semantic annotation might help to build the connections that we find in footnotes and annotations out of the text itself. So Recogito, and the link to the tool is at the bottom there, is a web-based annotation tool for text and images. It's a tool that makes use of semantic geo-annotation to co connect annotations made in a text to sources outside of that text. It's open source software and it's currently maintained by the Pelagius Network, which is an international humanities linked open data initiative. 
And if we click on the video and it plays, you can see this in action. Um, so what Recogito allows you to do is to highlight in a text people, places, and events, to mark them as people, places, or events, and verify those marks with using a gazetteer. You can build relations between people, places, and events. And you can also repeat this process in uh, on images as well. So in a PDF of an image or a JPEG or um, stuff that you have used, uh, you've imported using a IIIF manifest from various archival sources. Now, this is cool and interesting, but really the value for many of the people that we work with and for the scholars who use this tool is not so much in that process itself, which is interesting, but in what you then do with those annotations that you create, because those are semantic annotations. They can then be downloaded in the tool. Um, and now once you've marked up and annotated the places, people, and events, and the relations between them, you can then download them in a variety of formats, which can then be used in other programs or in conjunction with other tools. And then you can start exploring the significance of the data and the significance of the connections between them. Um, in the next slide, we can see some of the uses that uh, some people have put Recogito to in terms of of these um, facilities or abilities. So uh, one of the other ways in which Recogito is able to kind of break out of the analog footnote model or the analog annotation model is that it allows for collaborative work. So uh, in the black and white image on the right hand side, that is the collaborative annotation of a 13th century um, map that's been worked on by a team at Rutgers University, where these maps um, have been scanned and uh, various different scholars add their annotations onto the collaborative image. Uh, in, the in the image on the left-hand side, uh, what you see there is an example of a collaboratively created digital scholarly edition where the different colored annotations have been made by different people and tags have been attached to these annotations and to the relations between these annotations in a sort of layered way. If you look Underneath some of them, you can see a small number of tags. By stacking up these tags, uh, what the researchers are able to do is essentially build a digital scholarly edition collaboratively. So this is great for texts and for images, but what we realized fairly early on in the process was that also there are a lot of scholars who are interested in things. And so how do we deal with things? So in the next slide, what you'll see is an example of another tool that we created called Peripleo. The link to the tool is there and it's free and open to use. Peripleo is a linked data search engine, which allows scholars and researchers and users to explore the connections between objects via their shared references to place. And Unlike Recogito, which offers a degree of precision in searching, so when you annotate a place, you can pinpoint that place if it exists, if a semantic link exists between that place and an entry in the gazetteer. Uh, what Peripleo is much more is a sort of jumping off point into uh, an enormous amount of objects. I think the last check we were sitting at like almost a million objects. Um, from 40 collections of archeological, numismatic, photographic, and epigraphic materials. Um, that we have been able to access using linked data formats uh, from collections all over the world. And what you see in the image on the right is I've done a search for the Tetradrachm of Alexander. Um, it's given me 15,000 plus results. And then by scrolling through the results that have, um, that have been rendered on that page and that are visualized in the map, I can then start exploring connections between these different objects and between the areas in which they've been found or where they may be kept now. Uh, you can filter your search results by period. So you can um, look only for objects that come from particular periods. And then you can also filter by place. Again, this is open source software and maintained by the Pelagius network. And what really I think is significant about this is that in working with Peripleo and working with some of the archival and museum collections who provided their materials to us, 
I began to get a better idea of what the significance of linked data for cultural heritage collections is, and also how difficult it can be. So if we jump to the next slide, um, we can see that there has been a growth in interest in linked open data and semantic markup for cultural heritage collections. It's um, the, the attraction I think is very obvious, the potential to link collections to each other and to link um, different types of materials and different types of objects together to reveal the connections that may have existed before they arrived in the collections. Um, there's a huge variety of types of objects. So art material, um, uh, manuscripts, numismatic material, the, the sky is really the limit in terms of the kinds of things. One area where I think there still needs to be a lot of work, and I'll talk about it a bit later, is in ethnographic materials. And there are very particular difficulties connected to the idea of linked data and ethnographic materials. Um, and there are millions of cultural heritage data points now in the linked data cloud. But I, I think there's a question that we should ask about this model because the linked data model emerged out of the natural sciences. Um, and it is a model that uh, relies on a certain degree of confirmation or specificity in a connection. And I think for humanities materials where uncertainty and ambiguity is part of the scholarly process where we don't always know what a connection might be and that is a significant aspect of the objects that we are discussing or of the text that's being investigated. Um, managing this kind of data isn't always easy. So to explain uh, where I see these difficulties and, and ways in which I think we might begin to think about answering them, uh, if we jump to the next slide, um, I want to talk a little bit quickly about what, where the value is for cultural heritage objects in a particular museum object. And I'm going to talk a lot about art objects because there's a lot of really good work that's been done in linked data and art collections. And then I'll look at some other types of objects as well. So for a lot of scholars, when it comes to um, cultural heritage material and particularly museum materials, the value is not just in the object itself, although many times these objects are priceless. The value is actually in the record um, where the research around the object is stored. And museum records in particular are never complete. They're never a finished thing. And like perhaps an archival record or a library record, which directs you to a resource, a museum record is the resource itself. Um, museum data or museum records are constantly updated and amended and expanded every time an object is in an exhibition or it's a source of some research um, or new connections are found, records get updated. And so uh, there's a constant kind of churn and changeover um, within museum object records, museum documentation records. And this is making sure that this information is accessible and complete and useful is an absolutely crucial part of the museum documentation process and museum documentation management process. Um, these records also hold other very important data. So if we have a look here at this particular object, which is the record for a painting by Vermeer uh, from the National Gallery of Art in the US and their online record for this, what we see is there's information around the entry itself and there are links within that entry to other to various people and also to outside resources. But on the left-hand side, we also see that there are links to other types of information as well. So provenance data, the exhibition history, a technical summary, a bibliographic information and so forth. Now, all of these links are really important because they are what allow this object to become part of a network or an ecosystem of other objects in other collections. Um, it's how we begin to be able to make connections that allow these collections of objects to become useful and not just beautiful. It's when we decentralize that information and connect it with other sources that the value of these objects really increases. So if we go to the next slide. Um, the problem is that this is really difficult often because museum data is complicated and it's messy. Um, 
museums often have very long collecting histories, 100 years and more. Um, they have a lot of stuff, and the stuff often is of different kinds and different types. So the types of data that ex may exist for different types of objects is uh, legion. Uh, filing systems are often very idiosyncratic, even within an institution. So uh, in the image here is of an accession register from the British Museum for a small subset um, of some of their African collection. But when I was researching this particular collection for my PhD, what I found was that actually this list was by no means uh, exhaustive. And in fact, if you have a look on the image itself, where you see objects number 17, 18, um, 17 and 18, just sort of a third of the way down the page, there's a little handwritten note that says, see opposite page. And if you look at the opposite page, there's a whole lot of additional information that's been provided about these particular objects. Now, this is okay if you're working with a relatively small collection and if the people who happen to be dealing with the register and the objects understand this process of the connecting of the information. However, this particular collection of objects that I was looking at had come into the museum in the 1800s. There was nobody there anymore who remembered the narrative that took place around these types of um, annotations and additions of information. Um, and so this can make, this sort of internal practices can make managing museum data extremely difficult sometimes. Um, if we have a look at the next slide, you can see that the objects themselves can also be tricky to manage sometimes. Here we have three paintings. Two of them are by the same person. One of them is not. They all have very similar names. And if you were to type any of these names into Google, it would be very difficult to filter out the, the answers that you get or the results that you get um, if you don't know exactly what it is that you're looking for. Um, in the next slide, we also see three objects, all called snuff boxes. These all come from the British Museum's collection. Um, one of them on the far left, the origin is uncertain. The middle one was made in Sri Lanka and the third one featuring Napoleon Bonaparte was made in Paris. These are all very different objects. And again, if you didn't know precisely what it was that you were looking for and you did a search for snuff boxes um, in the British Museum's online catalog, you would have to pick your way through all of these results. And the data model that we use when we are trying to create connections between linked data collections needs to be flexible enough to make allowance for this broad variance of snuff boxes. But at the same time, we also need to remember that the objects, the, the entity's identity as a snuff box is absolutely critical because it's what allows us to connect it to other things. Um, in the next slide, we'll see that it's not just objects that can be tricky, it can also be people. So going back to the artists, on the left, we see the union list of artist names uh, from the Gettys list, the Gettys resources online for Johannes Vermeer. There are multiple different names there, all of which he was known by and which have been referred to in various other sources. On the right, it might be a little tricky to see, but there are, um, Anthony von Dyck's names, and there are multiple names there as well. Again, these are all names which have been used in other sources and which therefore exist as a semantic connection between these lists as authority files and resources out there on the web. And so the model has to make allowance for these variations. If we go to the next slide. Um, the critical difference, I think, is in how it is that humanity scholars look for information and what it is that they're looking for. Because humanity scholars are often looking for things and not for strings of text, uh, computer reasoning isn't always nuanced enough to answer the kind of questions that we may have. So in this short text, which uh, is from an old version of Encyclopedia Britannica, we see one, two, three, four, 
five, six different people being named. Uh, they all have very similar names, but only one of them is the subject of this text. And this particular subject, which is the first Jan van der Heer who's mentioned here, the text also says to us, um, he's one of the painters about whom we know very little. Uh, so this kind of reasoning as it exists in this text is tricky enough uh, for a person to kind of pick their way through. For a computer, it's almost impossible unless you have a data system that, or a data model that allows for these sorts of flexibility. Um, thank you. Um, the other issue that museums have to think about when they think about putting their data into the linked data model is that while we may not know why something happened, that doesn't mean that we can change it. So this quote here from Catherine Davis, who worked on standardizing the Getty Provenance Index, I think really sums it up quite nicely. Um, it's not always possible to know why an editor entered Roman as a nationality for a particular artist. Um, but the fact is that it's there and that has to stay as part of the record. Otherwise there is a risk that the object that is being described is rendered unfindable. Now it's one thing if this is a, a question of trying to pin down the identity or the identity of a painter or the period during which they may have worked in Rome or lived in Rome, um, it becomes even more complex when we start thinking about uh, terminologies and particularly legacy terminologies that were sometimes used to describe people, often in the context of ethnographic museums. This again is a very difficult question, where and when to include problematic terminology or outdated terminology um, is a real headache because it has to be maintained in order for the object's records to remain true, but at the same time, terminology that's offensive or no longer valuable or used needs to be managed as well. And I'll get onto this in a little more detail in a moment. Um, if we go to the next slide. So the, the next point I want to make is that different scholars will look for different things in an object when they examine them. So while machines can't necessarily interpret strings of text in the way that humanity scholars might want them to. Um, we also can't, as people who work with the data and develop the data, we can't always anticipate what people might be looking for when they approach a cultural heritage resource. So for example, in this view of Delft, again by Vermeer, we can see that an architectural scholar or an architectural historian, for example, who's interested in the skyline of the city in the period, might be interested in certain aspects that you see in that painting where particular buildings were in relation to each other, um, what they may have looked like from a particular perspective. However, an environmental historian who's interested in looking at the course of the river or the levels of the river would have a different question. And a literary scholar who's interested in the books in which this painting features is going to be looking for different things again. Now, the great thing about linked data is that it provides, it makes provision for the complexity, which allows us to anticipate potential possible uses. We can just endlessly build out these sort of um, networks of, of data points and connect them to each other. And it also provides the flexibility to manage the uses that perhaps we can't anticipate. So connections can be built in ways which, you know, constantly allow for, for new connections to be made. Um, if we jump to the next slide. The point is really that it's, it is this decentralized uh, model, which is the strength of linked open data. So it allows for the building of interoperable connections between collections and for the breaking down of siloed information and siloed data, which may otherwise always sit in the same place. Um, by exposing this data for reuse, it also increases trust because an institution is far more likely to share their data it, with another institution if there's a mutual acknowledgement that that data is uh, useful and findable and, and open in the truest sense of the word openness. 
And so, uh, you know, a, a newspaper article can be connected to an image, can be connected um, to another data source in ways that strengthen the network um, by creating these connections between different collections. Um, in the next slide, um, I think that the really important point there that I haven't yet made is that the data has to be done, or the data has to be available in in a mode that is useful. Otherwise, um, it just risks reinforcing that siloed model. And, and I think here, this is where I'm going to start sort of um, asking some questions. So if we go to the next slide, for instance, um, Wikidata, which is a great source of linked open data and a great way of exploring linked open data, um, can sometimes be less usable than, than one might expect, particularly if you're not comfortable running queries um, like a Wikidata Pro. So often it's too granular, or there are other times when it's not granular enough. Um, you often need to have quite a clear idea of what it is that you're looking for to run a query. There's a degree of precision that's required that not every user has. At the same time, a user who doesn't really know what it is that they're looking for might struggle to browse through the vast amount of detail, or the vast amount of data that's in there because of the model that requires quite pre precise questions. Um, and this is precisely where uh, data explorers, or as I like to think of them, librarians, can be very useful. So in the next slide, we'll see a version of a tool which has been created by um, Wikidata users and allows for the browsing of uh, mainly art resources within Wikidata, fine art resources within Wikidata in exactly this kind of way. Now, unfortunately, I can't do a live demo of this. Um, I did want to show you an example of what would happen if you do a search through Protoss um, using the term depicts facial hair. But as you can see from the image here, um, you can search by type, by creator, movement genre, depiction of. Um, if you look through this particular view in Protoss, um, on the top left-hand side, you'll also see there are other views available. The one that I'm particularly intrigued by is Callisto. That gives you a map-based view of the collection. And this is all the material that's sitting in Wikidata. So it's, it can be a little bit slow sometimes. It's, it's an enormous amount of data to query. Um, but this map-based view gives really great um, overview of, firstly, of where collections are housed, but also of places that are depicted in various objects in the collection. So for example, you can start exploring how places like Syria may have been viewed by Western artists at a particular point in history. And as a jumping off point for, for starting to make your own inquiries into this mass of data, it's really useful. Um, if we jump to the next slide, this is another really great um, linked data for cultural heritage tool. So this is open art data. It's a project which uses provenance information from linked open data records to create links between collections. And the overall objective is to improve the provenance research that's out there about artworks which may have been looted during the Nazi period in Europe. And it does this by looking at the links between collectors, dealers, and institutions, and trying to trace back through the various databases which are connected together um, where artworks might be, how they might have gotten to where they got to, and which individuals had access or, or came into contact with them through these journeys. I highly recommend this um, tool. Firstly, their Twitter account is great. And secondly, um, all of the data is open and they encourage and request people to help them with processing the data and cleaning the data. It's not particularly difficult. Often it's just a question of attaching flags to particular names or to particular collections. So if you feel like doing a little bit of data exploration, this is a really nice place to kind of get your practice in. We jump to the next screen. Um, exploring Exploring open art data has really made me think recently about some of the ethical challenges 
um, that we are facing when we think about linked data in museums. Um, partly, as I mentioned earlier, if museum data reflects what a museum holds, then that data needs to take into consideration the context often in which it was created and by whom. And I think there's been a lot of discussion lately about finding ways to depict this contextual information, which I'm not sure the linked data model always makes allowance for. Um, and I think at the same time, there's also a risk that where there are inaccuracies or perhaps biases, by adding data from museum collections into the linked data cloud, there's a risk that we might scale up these problematic um, pieces of data or, or um, patterns within the data. And so I think there's a possibility for us perhaps to learn something from the work that's being done in big data and particularly with around health data or government data, but people who are really making, asking questions about the ethics of these sorts of data sets. I think the humanities in general and museum data professionals in particular could learn something from the questions that are being asked. So if we jump to the next screen. Um, if museum data reflects what the museum holds, um, if we take that as given, then I've been thinking a lot lately about uh, the recent acts that we've seen all over Europe and, and the United States of the toppling of statues, um, which is often surrounded by language of this belongs in a museum, it should go into a museum, there's no place for these objects except in a museum. And I, I'm not expressing an opinion about the rightness or wrongness of that, but I think it says something about how people see museums. So Danny Birchall, who does amazing work at the, in the digital side of the Welcome Collection in London, he's been collecting tweets where people have talked about museums in relation to these types of objects and then what this might mean for a museum. So does this mean that a museum is a place where hatred and humiliation get kept because that's where objects that represent these types of historical moments wind up? Or if we look at the next screen, um, is a museum not a place for respect or admiration? Or is it a place for respect or admiration? Um, and the last screen of this, or is a museum a place that just gets lumbered with stuff that nobody else wants? I think these are really important questions. And I think that we as scholars and professionals who work with museum data need to think very carefully about these types of questions because we are we have the potential or we have it within our um, remit to think about if this is what museums contain how this may then be transmitted outward into the linked data cloud and what that means for people who use that data or who reflect upon that data or who think that that data is reflective of a particular reality. We have a look at the next screen. Um, and many museums are thinking about this already. So uh, ethnographic museums in particular have done amazing work on these types of issues. Uh, the Pitt Rivers Museum, which incidentally does not have a linked data version of its database or catalog for very particular reasons. And one of them is this, um, when you access their catalog, just to use their collection online. Uh, there is a cultural warning in which any users are alerted to the fact that um, the language that's used in scientific research models from the 19th and 20th centuries are now outdated and offensive, and that there are materials in the museum's collection which, um, while held in public collections, are not for, were never intended for viewing by the public. And so for issues related to the age or gender or ceremonial status um, of people who see them, it may be problematic. And that there may also be materials in there related to deceased people or um, objects that contain human tissue or human remains. And if you want to use the database, you need to click on, um, if you were to look, see the screen, 
you would then have to click that you agree to the, these terms and that you acknowledge that any reuse of the data um, would have to be, you'd have to get permission from the museum beforehand to do this. So the question is, if we were to consider museum collections as a public good, and, and if there is an expectation that this material should be available as widely as possible, does holding this type of data prevent or um, restrict the museum's potential for adding it to the linked open data cloud? Should it just not be added at all? Or if it is added, how would it be added? And can the data model make allowance for this? Could we consider perhaps restricting certain parts of it? At what point does a collection become so restricted that it is no longer useful? I don't have answers to any of these questions, but these are the types of questions that I've been thinking about lately. Have a look at the next screen. Um, another example of this was the controversy a couple of years ago around the Google Art selfie. So this app is available, you can download it and use it. And um, the two writers uh, depicted here in the images are journalists, Catherine Shu and Megan Rose Dickey. They both worked at TechCrunch at the time. They tested the Google Arts selfie uh, with images of themselves and found very quickly that uh, what the results that were given, if a person did not fit into a particular cultural group or um, if the image that was provided did not match via Google's algorithm to a very particularly stylized ideal of Western artistic beauty, um, the results were dissatisfactory. The matches were fairly low, um, got a fairly low match and often the images themselves were problematic. They depicted people in um, well, they, they connected to artworks that depicted people in particularly um, biased and um, inappropriate ways. Now, we know that this is a problem with the algorithm. The training data that the algorithm got fed was uh, inherently unbalanced. But it's not only the problem of the algorithm, I think it's also the problem of the museum collections, because what this reveals is that the museums have been collecting materials that depicted certain people in particular ways for a very long time. And by making the, these collections and the data available, what the museums themselves were doing was sort of feeding into that imbalance. And so uh, while these types of collections of cultural heritage materials are a public good and should be made available as widely as possible, I think that there's also a consideration around context and content that needs to be taken by the museum collections themselves. So we jump to the last slide. And these are the sorts of questions that I've been asking lately of myself and, and in some of the work that I've been doing. So around ownership and consent, if objects weren't collected consensually, can we share them? And can we share the data related to them? Um, what is the line between a public good and a private matter? So for example, looted art data or data about looted art, I think Many people would make the argument that that's a public good and that that data should be available um, in order to conduct the type of research that open, the Open Art Data Project is doing. But where does that line come in? And then finally, the question of bias. So if big data create bias related to the conditions under which they were collected, by making those collections available as linked data, do we risk inadvertently reinforcing those biases by adding our data to the cloud. Um, I don't have any answers to these questions and I'm doing an enormous amount of reading at the moment um, from people who work with big data um, in much more contemporary contexts or um, in the context of medical data, government data, health data, um, to try and see if there are ways in which we can answer these questions for museums and for cultural heritage content in particular. Um, and I think with a few minutes to spare, that's it from me. Thank you. And thanks, Catherine. Hello, I'm back. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. That was really fascinating. Um, a really interesting look at kind of yeah, linked data and how it can work for humanities research and particularly the stuff you were just saying about ethics is something that's uh, particularly important and like you say there's lots of questions and I'm not sure if 
there, there are any easy answers <laughs> for this. Um, no, I don't just, think so. Sorry, I'll just stop presenting that. So uh, I wasn't able to see questions, but hopefully we have some. Would you prefer me to read them out? Would that be easier for you? Um, I, I, however you prefer. I mean, I'm not quite sure where to start. I guess as far to the top of the yeah the list as possible. Um, so there's a question here about Peripleo. I saw it and then I. Um, are all of the objects on Peripleo from European collections and how global is the data set? So that's a really good question. Um, it is mostly from European collections or collections of European materials, I should say, rather, because a lot of, actually a lot of the stuff um, is from the Nomisma project, which was a partner project of ours um, in the US based at the Numismatic Society um, in the United States. But the... Um, yeah, so it, it's mostly European material and mostly material from the ancient world. So we're looking at kind of Roman material, some Egyptian material, um, not very much material beyond the early modern period. Um, so I would say not that global. Um, the next question, are Recogito and Peripleo available for use by museums and archives? Um, and do the institutions have access to the data produced? Yes, so uh, we have a couple of archival collections in there and we have been working or had been working um, up until the end of last year with other museums and archives to bring their material in. What we discovered is that for a lot of museums and archives, getting their data ready into the linked data form that would allow it to be included in Periplo is really difficult. Um, there is a hurdle for a lot of institutions to, uh, and often that hurdle is about um, access to resources. So who has the time and the skills and the money to prepare the data for inclusion? Um, but yes, in theory it is available and we would always encourage others to join us. Um, Peripleo, could it be connected with Ariadne Plus? Yes, it could. In fact, um, it was at one point. Um, and it's just a question of, of um, making sure that the connections and the APIs are updated. Um, unfortunately, the way that Periplayer worked was that uh, it was on the side of the institution to make sure that um, they kept up to date with any changes in the API that took place. And so oftentimes stuff would sort of fall off the radar for a little bit and then we'd have to send them an email and say, hey, you know, there've been some changes, can you? can you keep up with it? But yes, there were connections in the past and I think we'd be very keen to, to encourage those connections in the future. Um, question, what scope is there within the data model for different interpretations surrounding objects? If someone thought an object was a snuff box and someone else disagreed, how could this be represented? So there are, I mean, there are, are various ontologies for describing cultural heritage objects. And yes, there is a possibility within these various ontologies like the CIDOC CRM to, um, to include these different interpretations. Uh, the problem is that ontologies get really complicated really quickly. And so what one tends to find is that it sort of expands into these um, very large and eventually fairly unusable kind of spaghetti monsters of detail and and this is really I think the difficulty often for cultural heritage collections is there's a sweet spot between precision and usability um, and it's a quite a tricky point to hit because as I as I tried to explain with the Wikidata example you can be too granular and you can have too much detail in which case it becomes very difficult to find anything or you have the risk that something is far too general in which case it also becomes kind of unusable because you can't find precisely what it is that you're looking for. Um, but certainly at the at the level of different interpretations of objects, yes, there is a possibility um, for the model to make allowance for that. Um, the role of AI in making searching and browsing these knowledge graphs more intuitive. Uh, that's a really good question. I'm, I'm in no way an AI 
aficionado or expert, but there is work that's being done. When I was at the Europeana Tech Conference a couple of years back, um, I saw some really interesting presentations around AI, particularly when it came to the recognition of certain elements in paintings. <clears throat> at that point, it was far from far from exact, but I think there is work that's being done. Um, a question ah, from Debs. Hi. Uh, this connects to a point made by Stuart Dunn last week. Can annotations be imagined that do not in some way already anticipate and therefore limit the range of their connective utility? Conversely, are our annotation categories based on the plausible links we already have in mind? Can you elaborate on that a little bit? Deb, if you're there. Hi, yes, I am. Um, it's well, it was, it was it was something that was put in my head by by Stuart Dunn last week, where he said that, you know, the links that we posit through these annotations in some ways are um, articulations of the links that we know exist, uh, you know, woman to woman, adult, adult, adult as a as a, as a measure of age. Um, but I suppose you said earlier in the talk of how these um, how these annotations could potentially create new linkages that we hadn't imagined. And I suppose what I was trying to think of, how would that work? How could we create a linkage that we hadn't already in some way foreseen through the category, through the annotations um, that we make? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think there's, there's some interesting work that's being done on, um, on graph representations of these kinds of connections and annotations, which allow for a much more complex uh, connective or set of connective aspects, if that makes sense. Um, and I can certainly add, there was a paper recently by a group based in Donau, the University of Donau and in Vienna who have been looking at building a kind of um, almost a three-dimensional representation model, which allows for time and space and kind of horizontal and lateral connections, which perhaps might be the way to make those allowances for the unanticipated links, rather than thinking of them as kind of branching out in, um, one dimensionally, if that makes sense. But it's really complicated. And I didn't fully get to grips with it because my brain doesn't really work that way. But I think I think maybe that that kind of graph representation model, which allows for kind of multi-dimensional connections might be might be the way that it gets done. But I'll put that paper in the Zotero library so that people can see it. Um, could linked data be a way to help us historically contextualize cultural objects and put in dialogue those complex ideas about heritage? I hope so. I really hope so. I think, I think the difficulty often is in how materials are described in museum collections. So uh, what you often find in a museum catalog is, or in a museum database is that there's a controlled vocabulary for a lot of stuff, like where an object was found, what it is, the material it's made out of. Um, while that controlled vocabulary can be quite big, for example, like the names we saw, of, you know, vari variations on an artist's name, um, it's still limited enough. But often that contextual information comes in um, a field which is called notes or free text or um, additional text. Um, and then it gets more complicated because then you just have a, a really dense amount of material or contextualizing information that's given that is often very difficult to fit into the, the triple model because it's not just an instance of something or a relation between two things. It's, it's human written, not necessarily machine readable, contextual information and and I think until we find a way that provides for making that kind of information searchable 
and connectable within the model, it's going to be very difficult. And and I mean, you know, when you think about it in terms of perhaps one or two or three objects, okay, you can wrap your head around it. But when we think about the British Museum, which has eight million objects, even if only a fraction of them have this kind of free text, conditional, uh, free text, contextual information, which is written by individuals with very different styles and, and very different ways of using language, it can be very difficult to think about how we might scale up that kind of technological capacity to do exactly these sorts of humanities type dialogues, which I think we want to do. Um, Would a fully interoperable linked data cloud enable other institutions to add their own collections, which may have been assembled with different biases? Um, yes, I think would be the short answer to that question. Um, I mean, I think, I think any collection and the way that it's constructed in terms of the way that the the data is structured is going to reflect the, the context in which it's created. And um, in terms of adding material to the linked data cloud, there's no reason why anyone or any institution with its own kind of contextual um, shaping shouldn't be able to do that if I've understood the question correctly. Perhaps that might be the way to balance it out would be to have different institutions adding information about the same objects. Um, all archives, to a greater or less extent, contain materials that belong somewhere else, in particular imperial archives. So should any linked data project be conceived as necessarily disruptive of that dear spatial order? Yes, I think. I, I would say so. Um, I think this is one of the areas where perhaps it is possible, and particularly with archival materials, to think about that disruption or that um, expansion of the model in a way that highlights and points to um, the kind of more complex chains of history or, or chains of of contact that can be found if you dig through archival materials or, or museum materials. I think the question for me often is, when we think about what the priorities should be in terms of the representation of the data, um, when we think about the triple, uh, what bit do we think is important? And do we need to reconsider where we think that emphasis should be in shaping how we arrange the data and how we build those connections out. Um, another question. So we've hit the hour, but if people are happy to stick around for a little while and yeah, I, don't, I think growing. it's fine. Yeah, okay. I think that might be the last question anyway, unless someone's still frantically typing, but go ahead. Okay, okay, great. Um, this will help researchers in the future, but is there potential for easy public accessibility, creating a system which will make almost instant sense to an onlooker with information there, and therefore potentially opens up many institutions worth of knowledge? Europeana always comes across as pretty obvious to me, but I'm not sure how well known it is to the public. I think that's a really good question, and I think I think part of that has to do with the way that we've come to think about searching for information. So I think if we think about searching for information or searching through a, a data set as having to be as easy as Googling something, then it's going to be very difficult for us to think about ways of expressing complexity using something that or using a search logic like Google, which sort of flattens things out and and just looks for immediate correspondences. 
I think what we found when we were developing Periplayo is once we explained to people that a dot on a map did not mean that one thing got found in one place, but that they were kind of cumulative and um, a bigger dot might have meant slightly more material, but that it wasn't a one-to-one -one representation, but rather a kind of portal into a whole set of materials. Um, it became much easier for people to think about it as a sort of exploration mechanism rather than a hard and fast answer or, or a mechanism for providing a hard and fast answer. And I think, I think this has to do with how we think about results, actually. Like, if we think that there's only one answer, then it's going to be very difficult to think about um, opening up those kinds of knowledge. I think, and this is where I think humanity scholars have an, a significant role to play, is that if we can convey the idea that complexity, that the results are going to be as complex as perhaps the questions were, then we might be a little more open to um, a range of nuance in the results that we get, which in turn I think might make it a slightly easier system to build because you know, we're not looking for hard and fast answers. Are there any other questions? I think we done with the with the questions. I don't know if uh, any of the. the There's main... one quick question that just appeared. <laughs> Ah, cool. From Andrew. Um, how are sustainable are projects like Periplayo? Is there long term funding? That is an excellent question. Um, so, Periplayo is alive at the moment in a kind of frozen state in that we're not doing any more development on it because, yeah, I mean, it was a three year project and we got a lot done in those three years, but the money is now finished. Um, we are lucky in that we have partnerships with other projects such as Daria who have been able to help us keep the infrastructure or, or provided the infrastructure for us to keep these things going, at least in a kind of stasis. Um, so they will continue to exist and remain available as long as they're service space. But yeah, development is, is really difficult and it's, it's a tricky thing to do. Okay, I think that might have been the last question. Uh, did I interrupt you, Daniel? Were you saying something? Did you want to? No, no, I was, I was just saying that, that uh, I was just asking if uh, someone has another question, so it's, <laughs> it was one time. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> to, end, to end on the money question is always a good way to do it, right? <laughs> Uh, once, once again, thank you again for, for the wonderful presentation, Rebecca. Yeah, oh, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, and, and thank you to everyone for asking questions. Um, I really enjoyed this format and for the invitation. It was a very nice way to end my Friday. <laughs>